Welcome back. This is part 4 of. What if Issei was a half dragon hybrid? I won't drag this intro out any longer. So let's begin. Chapter 8. The morning that followed after events of the rogue fallen angels, Issei found himself in an unusual situation. The death of Donaseek stirred things up for everyone present and Azazel announced that he will meet everyone later in the ORC building. They spent the better part of the remaining night looking for trails of anyone responsible for all this mess and Issei could only thank his again awakened enhanced physiology that reduced his need for sleep. He didn't want replay of his zombie morning episode from earlier, nor he could sleep in the classroom like his brother. For what he knew, Septimus hypnotized their teachers, convincing them that he had a special case of insomnia. Thanks to that, they allowed him to sleep whenever he wants as long as he kept up with his studies. Issei entered the kitchen. There, instead of a normal morning hustle was a weird scene. Issei saw the female part of his family alongside their temporary guest standing around Odin's Valkyrie. The young woman, still in her combat clothes, was crying on a kitchen counter with a glass in her hand. As for the rest of the present, Marana and Asia stood by Rossweiss's sides with worried expressions. Izuna was jumping around her trying to take the alcohol away from the Valkyrie, his mother was in the middle of hiding a bottle of liquor and Elaine just stood with a steaming bowl and watched it all with a serious face. Z's old Burford, Alve's laughing at me und choking because I can't find ein boyfriend. Und zen leaf me like zat to co pack to Asgard alone. Damn him to Helheim, Rossweiss screamed into the air waving her hands unknowingly dodging Izuna's attack on her glass. With her flustered face and heavy Norwegian, German accent, it was obvious that she was drunk, however why she was even in his house remained a mystery to Issei. Walking up to Elaine, Issei grabbed another steaming bowl and asked between the bites. Morning sis, what's going on? Without any other reaction than turning her eyes on Issei and moving her chopsticks slightly faster, Elaine continued eating in silence. When she finished, the blonde answered while reaching for next portion. Morning. It looks like when you were gone, Odin went back home but forgot to take his escort with him. When the poor girl found out, she poured herself a drink and started crying here. Issei turned back to Valkyrie and seeing the state she was in, he deadpanned. How much did she have? One drink. After that, Elaine focused on consuming the food. Eating in silence, the siblings stared at the screaming woman, disbelief imprinted on the male face. It continued for around five more minutes when a sharp sound drew everyone's attention. Ka Ching. In the middle of the kitchen appeared a vertical portal, out of which came a big cloud of sand. Cough damn it, I messed up teleportation spells. Cough, Septimus came out of the closing portal dressed in a colorful poncho and large sombrero on his head, coughing like a veteran smoker. He dusted himself off then noticed that everyone in the room stared at him. Even the drunk Rossweiss calmed down, her eyes switching between the teenager and the glass in her hand. Ola, Nekomata served everyone his trademark grin and waved his new hat. Using momentary distraction, Izuna leapt over the table, snatching the alcohol from other silver-haired woman and threw it into the sink from midair. The glass traveled perfectly into the sink without as much as spilling a drop. Clang. Landing on all fours, she quickly jolted up and did a little twirl. Yay. Perfect shot. Praise my skills. The girl cheered, happily jumping, earning enthusiastic applause from Asia and Marana, a hazy look from Rossweiss and no reaction from the rest. What's with those clothes? And why? There's half of a desert on my floor. What do you have for an excuse, Septimus? The cold voice of their mother came out from behind the counter seemingly froze even the smallest grains. Well, I'm listening. However, Septimus didn't seem to notice dangerous tone in Hyodo Matriarch, as he kept smiling. It's nothing, Okaa-san. I've been following the magic trail that Issei sensed around the church, and it led me to Mexico. It ended up being a dummy, but at least I bought this cool outfit and the best coffee I've ever had. 
Highlighting his words, he laid two dusted thermoses on the table. Coffee. When Izuna saw the thermoses, her eyes shone brightly and in the next second, she was flying towards them. However, her flight was cut short by Elaine, who caught her while putting down another empty bowl. Not for you, you're hyperactive enough even without that. Septimus, stumbling back at the unexpected attack, sighed with relief. Thanks, Ella. Yeah, so I'll just go and hit the bed now. I promise I'll clean this up later Okaa-san. I now desperately need to sleep. Bye. The teenager lazily strolled towards the stairs, until he hit an invisible barrier in the doorway. Don't. Bye. Me here. You have school today and you are going there. Akiro walked up to him, passing the now dead asleep Rossweiss and the two church girls that tried to keep Valkyrie from falling down. But Ka-san, Septimus turned to his mother. No, and before you go there, you will clean yourself in this place, mister. Or else I'll clean you here and now. Blue magic circles appeared from the woman's hands and were spreading threatening aura in teen's direction. Quote dot dot dot. Hi, Ka-san. The defeated teenager bowed his head before the might of Hyodo Akiro, knowing all too well that he had no chance against her. The only one who could pride himself in winning an argument with that woman was her husband, Guro. Unfortunately for his son, he was always out early for his work. I should get ready too, otherwise I'll soon join Sep. Issei turned to his sisters, Elaine still held the wiggling Izuna, but her free hand moved towards the food was reserved for their brother. Seeing Issei's meaningful look, the oldest sister shrugged shamelessly and grabbed the food. There's no point in leaving it to waste. Munch. DXD. Issei sat in his classroom, the rest of the perverted trio standing next to his desk. His friends were in a great mood, as they finally had succeeded in their peaking session without getting pranked and or getting beaten. They were in the middle of describing it to the brown-haired Hyodo. Their nemesis and proclaimed traitor, Septimus, was sleeping behind with headphones hanging on his neck and his head hidden in the crook of his arm, too tired to even think about a missed chance to prank. Come on Issei, you have to use this chance and join us while your brother is tired. There's no risk of him pulling something off today, so we can go and watch some changing girls. Motohama exclaimed loudly, earning the stink eye from the females inside the room. Before Issei could answer, the door to the classroom opened and their teacher walked in. With everyone hurrying to their seats, the man coughed and took out a pile of documents. I have some news. I know it's unexpected, but we will have more transfer students. So, sit down and let's have the introductions. After that, the classroom erupted with whispers between the students. Issei knew who was going to enter and was the only one stayed calm but Septimus sleepily raised his head with a confused look. Did I misheard something or did he just say, students? When both brothers tried to think who could be the mysterious additional student open angle bracket they already knew one was their sister close angle bracket, the door to the classroom opened. And one black and one auburn haired girls in Kuo Academy uniforms entered, the latter hiding shyly behind the other. Welcome our two new students, Shitarova Hyodo Murana and Amano Rainer. Please, say something about yourself. The whole class turned completely silent at the arrival of the girls. Septimus and Issei bored their eyes into the girl that no longer than a few hours ago unwillingly fought against them, now looking perfectly well. Hello, my name is Amano Rainer. I and my younger sister live with our uncle, who moved here because of his work. As we are friends with Hyodo family, he arranged that we be enlisted here. I hope that we can all be friends. The raven-haired fallen angel said in a sweet voice, that immediately won her almost whole male part of the class. After that, she turned with a warm smile to the girl hiding behind her, lightly pushing her to the front. It's your turn, say something. The young nun stumbled to the center of attention, clearly uncomfortable with the position she was in. Nervously twirling her finger, Marana raised her head and stuttered quietly. H H hello. M my name is M Marana, PP please take care of me. 
Her cute behavior made everyone, including the teacher release long, dreamy, ah. When everyone started to overflow the new classmates with questions, Issei turned to his now fully awake brother. What's going on here? I have no idea, but now I know how you felt when I popped up out of nowhere. Although I had much better entrance and my performance wasn't so fake. Septimus couldn't help but leave a jab. It's obvious that it's Azazel's doing, but why? And since when did Rainair have a sister? I don't know, but I'm gonna get the answers out of her Azaz ASAP. With that they turned their attention to the questions being asked of the girls, both noting in their minds who asked their sister some weird question or made her feel uneasy, waiting for the lesson to end. DXD, Rainair, I'm happy that you're safe and all, but please tell me what is going on here. Why you're here and joined our class on top of that? Issei ran after Rainair the moment the class ended, wanting to get some answers from her. Sorry, Azazel asked me not to tell anything. He wants to explain it himself. Anyway, where did you lose your Cretan brother? Or is he hiding from me? Then Fallen Angel looked around, trying to spot the other Hyodo. Noticing that his brother wasn't anywhere in sight Issei just shrugged. He'll find us. He's probably off to lay some traps or make a fool of someone. Let's go meet Azazel. Somewhere halfway to the old school building, the school speakers turned on and started transmitting the voice of the familiar cat. Is this thing on? Well, there's the red light, so it's probably on. So, hello, for those that don't know me, I'm Hyodo Septimus, Hyodo Issei's brother. You should at least know him. What did this idiot come up with this time? The fallen angel and the dragon chorused tiredly. I'll make it short. Today, my three sisters entered this school. Now, if anyone will peek on any of them while they're changing, do something funny, or I don't know what else, I'll rip your eyeballs out and make you eat them. I'm talking particularly to two perverts, Lolicon Baldi and Glasses Measurement. And pray that I'll catch you before either of my brothers, cause they're as big siskins as me, if not bigger. Ha ha ha, he's a bigger moron than I remember. Rainair burst into a laugh. Issei only facepalmed, feeling his ground level reputation digging a nice, neat grave for itself. As I am currently on air, maybe I should tell something, like a little impro. Or it's better too, in the background of Septimus, audition, there was the muffled sound of a violently opened door, followed by the angry voice of the student council president. How did you get in here? Why are you using the school network to broadcast weird threats? And why are you still airing? Splash. Her tirade was followed by a sound that awfully close resembled one of a large amount of water hitting the floor that was accompanied by nervous laughter of someone being threatened with a large amount of pain. I think that our dear SC Prez did a great for a newbie in showbiz, so give her a big applause. Now, Hyodo Radio is out before I get killed. Till next time. The broadcast ended abruptly. At this point Rainair was on the ground, laughing as if she'd lost her mind. Actually, Issei thought for a moment that it was some aftereffect of her recent mind control. Rainair calmed down soon but their entire walk to the ORC was filled with a few snickers here and there in random hiccup. When they entered the orc building, the first thing they saw was very wet and very annoyed Nekomata using a magic circle to dry himself. Rainair, who again got into a laughing fit, immediately used the chance presented before her. Bwahahaha, what happened? Someone sprayed some water at the big, bad siskin cat. And who normal admits that he's a siskin. She had to hold on to Issei to maintain her balance. With his eye twitching angrily, Septimus ignored the laughing girl and summoned a gust of hot air. A few seconds later, dry and with the dangerously pulsating vein on his forehead, Septimus put on a falsely concerned smile. Oh, hey Ray, be careful or you'll choke. Of course, I can help you with that, clenching my hands around your throat squeezing all the air out of you. Rainair forced herself to calm down, a sadistic glint flashing in her eyes as she swayed her breast. Oh, so you're now into this kind of things. How about I switch into some leather outfit and we play a little? 
that hit Septimus right in the weak spot, making him gulp loudly and take a step back. Ugh, no thanks. Grimacing, he tried to shrug it off. All right, you won this round. I already have one SM freak here, there's no need for another. But in overall stats, I'm still ahead of you. Only slightly, and even that won't be for long. Issei, watching from the side how those two continued their childhood shenanigans, smiled widely, knowing exactly how to trigger both of them. Oh WWW, you two look so cute together. Just kiss already. Fuck off. Never with her. Fuck off. Never with him. Both of them raised him by the collar, mirroring each other down to the facial expressions. You even get angry the same way. Just forget about what happened and go on a normal date already. Issei couldn't stop from chuckling, remembering the drama that happened in the Grigori because of these two. Both black-haired individuals looked at each other and dropped Issei. Gaining some distance between themselves, both turned around and fixed their uniform. I will not take romantic advice from someone who proclaimed that he's going to build world's best harem, but never even dated. Rainair shot back, but what was an intention half-innocent jab, accidentally ended up being an arrow aimed at the barely healed mental wound. Sulking, Issei hung down his head, reminiscing about recent events. Thank you very bitch, that was low. Do I have to remind you that only a few days ago, his first date killed him, hardly because of you. Septimus came between them, his comment hitting the girl like a fist in the gut. Then, he pointed at his brother. And you were supposed to let the go of the past and look into the future. It's not that easy. Do you think that I can just decide to ignore it and be all sunshine? Stuff like that requires time and it's not even been a day. Right then, the doors behind them opened and, in them stood an annoyed Azazel. I don't want to interrupt your soap opera here, it's great to watch and I'd want to have it recorded on beer night. But, I don't have time for this and redhead princess said that she also had some plan for the day. Therefore, put your crying on a later date and get in so I can be done with my stuff. Following behind their weird semi-uncle, the trio faced Rias Grimori sitting behind the desk with a stack of papers, her peerage, the rest of Hyodo's sibling and, surprisingly, there was also Mittel, standing alone in the corner. The devils sat at their usual spots, watching warily the blonde fallen, both sides not used to this situation. As for the Hyodo sisters, Izuna, who had her hair styled to cover her red eye, was entirely focused on the magazine in her hands. Marana sat without her cross beside Kaneko in silence and Elaine was discussing the blend of tea with Akino. That would be all, if not for the fact that instead of Kuo's girl uniform, Elaine wore its man's version. All right, everyone's here, great. What I have to say is that is Rainer's and Mittelt's punishment, from now till I state otherwise they are under direct orders of Septimus and Issei respectively. And with that done, I'll be on my way. Barely after they sat down Azazel spoke and just as fast he summoned Magic Circle to teleport away. Wait, the fuck, eh hey, Azazel Sama, I'm what? Four voices screamed, stopping the Governor General right before he vanished. Azazel turned to them and waved dismissively. Because of your insubordination, you two are demoted, suspended and sent here to serve as assistants for those two. That's the official version, in reality. You screwed up and now have to live with them and do what they order you to do. You have 30 seconds to ask any more questions. The black-winged duo stared dumbfounded at their leader. During the briefing when they woke up, Azazel was in his carefree mode, acting like what happened earlier was not their fault and girls thought they'd be free of any consequences. And now, without any warnings, he gave them away like slaves. Well, they are almost slaves now. They could only pray that the teenagers didn't connect the implication that way, even if there wasn't much chance for a success. Basically, you, they too but mostly you, fucked up and now give them to us as slaves. Issei asked, immediately finding the worst in the situation for two fallen angels. More or less, did you really have to assign Uselessnare to me? Can I trade her for the blonde lowly? 
whined Septimus. No, I already have enough paperwork thanks to you leaving ten exorcists with ear hemorrhaging, temporary deafness and trauma of metal music. Azazel barked out. It was dubstep, not metal. Teach your people to recognize the music. Septimus muttered. Can I at least put a collar on my slave? What? Rainair roared. I don't care about any of those. Do whatever you want. Time's up and I have to think on how to interrogate ten mentally damaged dimwits. Without another word, Azazel stepped into the circle and disappeared. For a minute everyone stayed silent, the devil's not really sure how to react to what happened and Hyodo girls curious about the new development. Then, Rainair with her eyes glued to the floor turned slowly to Septimus. With thick ominous aura, she summoned two light spears that shone threateningly. I can stand this punishment. I went against the rules, tried to gain power and planned to use for that someone under Grigori protection. That's reasonable, but try to put a collar on me, or anything like that and I promise you, I'll play nice, but the moment you let your guard down I'll kill you in the most painful way I can imagine. Septimus just played with his headphones, completely unfazed by the threat. Yeah, you're right, a collar is in a bad taste. But how about calling me, Septimus Sama? Strangely, I like my full name with that honorific. Crack. Everyone in the room stared at one of her light products impeding itself in the floor between Bishop's legs. Raising his eyes on its creator, he teased further. And maybe barking. Thanks to Azazel you're my bitch now, so you should act like one. When his brother started running from the spear throwing, demonic open angle bracket no pun intended. But she's more fallen. Close angle bracket female, laughing about getting his point back, Issei walked over to the second fallen angel who silently stared where her leader disappeared. It must be a hit if you're not used to Azazel being Azazel, but I hope we can be good partners. He smiled warmly, making Midelt flustered. I it's not like care, T this is. Hey. Don't try to hog fake Shinobu for yourself, I still want to replace Uselessnair with her. Shouted Septimus while jumping between Kiba and Kaneko over the table, still chased by his new subordinate. Why? Fake Shinobu. Rias spoke up, trying to see the pattern in her servant's habit of giving nicknames. Ah, so she doesn't know the Monogatari series. Well, the running cat noted in his mind but then he and Rainair suddenly got stuck in the air with invisible strings wrapped around their necks. Can you two calm down and stop acting like children? It's annoying. The calm voice of Elaine, who had her hand held out, brought attention on her. My. Headphones. And. Air. Septimus choked, clawing at his throat. With a flick of her wrist, the invisible wires for a second shone blue before retracting back to her fingertips and letting the two troublemakers land on the floor. Oni-chan is just in his soon soon mode. Like any other Sunere, that's just how he shows his feeling. Izuna commented still hidden behind her paper. I'm not Sunere, and for sure I don't have any feeling towards Rainair. Septimus opposed and sat down, Rainair unwillingly sitting next to Mittelt. Leaving Sep and his feelings aside, as Azazel mentioned I also have something to say. What was it again? Oh, right, today is a full moon, so we're going to get our new recruits their familiars. You know what they are? Rias asked from her chair. Yes, Elaine have one, although it's an exceptional one. Issei nodded, motioning to his sister for her to summon it. A navy blue magic circle appeared in the air, full of mathematic symbols arranged into an endless spiral. A blue swarm of particles that formed a holographic image that looked like Elaine then emerged a second later. What do you need, my creator? It spoke in a happy female voice. Can you introduce yourself to everyone? Elaine asked politely, as you wish, my creator. I am MEAI Magically Empowered Artificial Intelligence, the creation of Elaine Hyodo. I serve as her familiar friend and sometimes support her in cyber attacks. It's an honor to meet you. The glowing face turned around, her color changing to more deep one. Devils and Mittelt stared astonished at glowing face. Creation. You mean that, 
Kiba started uncertainly. Nei Chan made her when she couldn't pick herself a familiar. She said that none could fit her preferences so she built the perfect one. Izuna answered for him. Rius watched the familiar and its master, finally understanding what Azazel said when he introduced the blonde devil as a genius. To mix technology with magic and create yourself a familiar was the same as if creating a perfect homunculus. Making it so it can qualify to make a contract with it made it an even grander feat. Very impressive. Her servants nodded in agreement. The praised half-devil smiled at that. Thank you, but even though she calls herself my friend, I can't make her call me anything else than creator. Because that's what you are, creator. Me I held firmly her ground. Oh, even more impressive. But, about the familiar hunt, we're waiting for one more person and then we can head to the familiar forest find you one. Actually, she should be here already. I wonder what held her. Just when the crimson-haired girl ended her statement, the doors to the room opened and busty young woman in a Kuo Academy uniform, with long, brown hair arranged in multiple drills entered. Hello. Sorry I'm late, I just saw two painted guys running from a group of girls and couldn't help but watch. At her last words, Issei and Septimus perked up. What color? Red, or blue? The black-haired brother asked. Blue, but how did you know? She asked confused. I'm the one who set up that trap. If it's blue, then it should be the archery club. Those idiots didn't know that I don't have to be there to bust them, I'm always prepared. The trickster boasted proudly, give them a break, they don't stop complaining to me and barely even talk to me when not doing that. Issei tiredly complained, the peerage wasn't sure if them becoming accustomed to those situations was a good thing, but slowly it was more and more like a daily routine. And with all the new club members, it was going to become even more lively. Rising from her seat, Rias walked to the other girl. For those who don't know her, this is Kiyom Abe, my classmate, and a beast tamer. As an expert, she will help you pick your new familiars. Kiyom looked over the gathered and her eyes stopped when they landed on the half-devil. Ella, it's you, do you remember me? She waved happily to the blonde. Elaine stared at the girl for a moment, when a spark of recognition shone in her eyes. Kiyom, so you study here too? Yes. But why are you in boy's uniform instead of your own? As Beast Tamer asked about it, everyone looked curiously at the cross-dressing half-devil. This school uniform skirt is too short for my taste, it is almost non-existent and does not provide any cover. So I changed it. Elaine stated simply, me I shaping into an arrow and pointing at Keon's uniform to emphasize her word. All the girls looked down on their skirts, seeing Elaine's point. As for Issei, he couldn't count how many happy accidents with pants flashing for him with stronger gusts of wind happened already. That was one of many blessing of this school and team promised to be grateful till the end of his life to anyone who chose uniforms for the glorious sights that graced his eyes and were immediately burned in his mind. If I were a girl, I'd sue whoever designed it. But at least the male one is cool. And mostly black, Septimus commented at his blazer. I think it's cute, Marana shyly stated in a voice barely louder than a whisper, tugging the ends of her skirt. Akino, leaving the case of decency of their uniforms, looked between Elaine and Kiyo. You do know each other. We played together as children. She then looked at Issei as if something struck her. Wait, so Issei is your brother? And you didn't recognize me? She jumped to the perverted teenager. You're Kiyo Abe Senpei tennis club captain. But have we ever met? Issei mumbled dumbly, his mind entirely focused on girls' impressive breasts that now were pressed against him. Kiyom then turned to Septimus. At least you remember me. Quote dot dot dot. Hum, nope. He answered after searching through his memory for a moment. She tried to tame you both when you were eight. Elaine reminded them. That clicked something in their minds and both brothers recalled a girl playing with their sister. Hiccup. Septimus rose from his spot, screaming at his epiphany. At her old nickname, Keon. Stumbled few steps back, as if struck by an arrow. 
You only remembered that. You were coming over, always saying how you'd become a great beast tamer like the rest of your family. And when Elaine told you who we are you wanted to start with me and Seth. Issei recalled, putting the image of the school's tennis club captain next to memory of his sister's childhood friend. Yeah, not the best impression. On the side note, taming this dragon now would be a lot easier for her. Just sway of those big boobs, few hushed promises and you got yourself a weapon of mass destruction. Septimus snickered, but then scratched his chin. Or maybe not so easy, with the competition she has here. At his joke the voluptuous devils and beast tamer looked at their breasts, pushing them a little, then at the mentioned dragon, who stared shamelessly at them with a dreamy face. Meanwhile, Kiba watched them with an awkward smile, wondering what he should do here. Elaine ignored them and focused on MEAI. Izuna didn't even move her eyes from the magazine. Marana smiled seeing the family atmosphere that was forming. Two fallen angels didn't care for anything and cried in their hearts over their fate. As for Kaneko, she looked at her small breasts and whispered to them. Don't worry about those two perverts. You'll soon get bigger and put them all to shame. All right, leaving it all aside, we have to move to the familiar forest, or else we'll have to wait for another full moon. Hyodo family, Rainer san Mitelt san your memberships to a cult research club are approved and you're officially part of the club. And everyone else, stand together and we'll teleport. After a short while, the devil group with Kiyom teleported out of the room. When the flash of magic circle died down, Rainer stood up and looked frantically around the almost empty club room. Wait, what memberships? Where the hell did you go? Halloween Omake. Inside the Hyodo residence, Akiro Hyodo stood with a knife in front of a band of small monsters staring at her with hungry eyes, ready to attack at the slightest sign. Holding the silent staring contest, the woman twirled her weapon, testing the grip and then attacked with lightning speed. Chop. Small blade dug loudly into the head-like object and with few quick slashes, its sticky guts were flying around, miraculously avoiding the woman's clothes. Throwing it at the group, she immediately attacked another one and repeated the procedure flawlessly few times. Guro. Guro ran with prismatic flames in hands to help his wife. Jumping next to her, he divided the fire and shot it into every thrown object, igniting them from the insides. A few moments later, the little creatures threw their burning heads into the air, in the married couple's hands appeared magic circles that flew and held them levitating. Oh, five of Hyodo children with their ages mediator being eight gave a collective sigh at various jack-o'-lanterns circling around them and shining in a spectacle of colors. To make it better, with a small flick of his wrist, Guro made the pumpkins smack their carved faces and laugh loudly while they flew around the decorated house. That's almost all for Halloween preparations. Soon the guests will arrive and after dinner you'll go with other kids to hunt for sweets. Do you have your costumes ready? Mr. Hyodo turned to his children, whose shining eyes were still following the flying heads. At his question, the pack turned from pumpkins. Yes. What do you think? Otu-san, Oka-san. With childish enthusiasm Izuna ran toward him, followed by the rest trying to show off their costumes. Looking at them both adults smiled warmly. They made a mismatching and standing out group, each of them having a different kind of disguise. The youngest one was in a red fairy princess dress, with her hair braided and held by a crystal tiara, her shining wand and wings leaving behind a prismatic trail. Next to her stood Marana dressed as a modest bride, with a white veil hiding her face and holding a bouquet of white roses. Elaine, standing slightly behind them characterized herself on a cyborg. She had the higher part of her face covered by a mask with shining eyes, as well as metallic armor over most of her body. You three looks incredibly cute. I'm sure you'll get tons of candies tonight. Guro laughed as he kneeled down and hugged his daughters. Candies. Elaine repeated with a dreamy voice. Oka-san, how about us? Issei tried to draw their mother's attention by waving his hands over his head. 
Issei dressed like Son Goku from his favorite anime in his Super Saiyan form, with a bright yellow wig on his head and the telltale orange and blue kimono. And beside him stood Septimus in a complete shinobi equipment, with only his orange eyes being visible. But the things that didn't match were his two colored cat ears and white tail that stuck out, mixing together into a funny combination. You two look absolutely terrifying. Is your brother still in his room? Yes, he said. My costume will beat all of yours and I'll get all the jellies, then locked himself and still didn't come out. Okaa-san, do you think that we'll get marshmallows that look like boobs? Azazel said that the best boobs feel like them in hand. At the thought of heavenly sweets taking the form of a perfect creation, drool flooded young Issei's mouth. I don't know, but wouldn't hope for that. I know however who will hear a long lecture about teaching inappropriate things to eight-year-olds. Akiro answered, promising herself to show someone with black wings a true monster this Halloween and teach this person some common sense. Feeling the tugging at her apron, Akiro turned to the pair of orange eyes staring at her eagerly. Will Rain Yatilda re come too? Smiling at her second son's way of speaking, she roughed his ears fondly. Of course she will. Azazel promised to bring her with him and the rest. They should be here any minute. Knock knock. Loud knocking sound stopped Miz. Hyodo in the middle. Oh. Maybe it's them. Open the doors and check out. Just when she finished, the impatient child ran to the doors. However, his smile quickly vanished, when behind the doors instead of the black winged party were two adults and a nine-year-old girl with brown frills. Oh. You're Nyat Nyankli Zaz, the little Nako ninja said, looking around for those he expected. We've brought Kiyom on a party here. She was so happy to go gather sweets with Elaine Chan. The woman smiled, pushing lightly the girl, who was in a werewolf costume. Closing the door behind them, Septimus turned and shouted inside the house. Ella, Hiccup is here from you. Hearing her nickname, the future beast tamer involuntary hiccuped and ran inside wounded. Knock knock. When they headed to the living room, someone again knocked at the doors. Looking at them suspiciously, Septimus didn't notice his brother walking up to him. Why are you staring at the doors? Shouldn't you open them? Just a meowment ago Naya one was there. Opening the doors again, they saw the group of fallen angels, consisting of Azazel, Kokobiel, and Shemhazai in their normal wear. Yo, kids, make room for a bigger group, because the rest will come when they'll finally drag Barakiel from his sulking. The man really needs to lighten a little, and nothing's better than a monster-themed party at strip club, where we'll taking him after. Azazel said as he pushed himself between Septimus and Issei into the house. Issei, watching newly arrived tilted his head in. Confusion. While crossed his arms over the chest. Why only Uncle Kokobiel dressed for a Halloween party? And where were Mew a meowment ago, like a minute earlier? Very funny, runt. I wonder if you'll have the strength to joke at the next training session. The mentioned member of the cadre looked over the half dragon, edgy because of the joke. Lighten up a little, you actually fit the theme with your look. And Issei, I got you my new project, Boobsmallows. Azazel joined in with his insight. Boom. Before Kokobiel or Issei could answer, a loud explosion sounded from the upper floor, followed by clouds of smoke filling the house. Guro, I know, one of them blew something up again. I'll take care of this. Oni-chan, play with me. Nayo. And just like that, with a big dose of chaos and a bang, Halloween was about to start in Hyodo residence. Know your sin. Elaine Hyodo. Race. Half devil. Sin designation. Gluttony. Appearance. Blonde hair with pink ends reaching her shoulders, emerald eyes, slender build with B101 cm measures, 184 cm height, further information classified. Powers and abilities. Genius level intellect. Devil magic with an affinity for fire and electricity. Technomancy. Static veins. In form of invisible strings freely controlled by her. 
also allowing her to directly communicate with any hardware-based devices. Vast knowledge about various branches of science, magic, economy and other academics. Access to personal pocket dimension. Great tactician. Likes. Her family. Food. Tinkering with machines and magic. Peace and quiet. Hazard. Dislikes. Annoyances, imperfections, noise, talking about her eating habits. Short backstory. Elaine was found by Azazel shortly after Issei, cementing the idea of creating a family with mixed races. With unknown parents, she was found in the hideout of Stray Devil who most likely abducted her and took a liking to her. With her potential, she finished writing her doctor's degree at the age of 15 and is now attending Kuo Academy to live some normal high school life at the same time still studying ways of mixing magic and modern science chapter 9 hello everyone i hope that you had a great christmas and new year mine was great so great that i had a little fallback with posting this chapter i'm sorry that i didn't keep my promise to give you this before the holidays but it's here and that's what's important short info this story has a new cover with izuna on it made by my friend that I'm grateful to. Salute to you, if you finally have time to read it and not only to search for character description. As always, great thanks to everyone following, favoriting and reviewing, you're awesome. Betted by myself, Albion out loud telepathically, Diedreg out loud telepathically, Electric and others, with the red light dying out around them, Rias group with Keon looked around their new surrounding. They appeared at the outskirts of the familiar forest as planned, and it looked rather gloomy. Trees without leaves, mixed with slowly setting sun casting long shadows and silence around them resulted with highly uninviting aura. I can't wait to get my familiar. It's gonna be some cute and busty girl. She'll be calling me, master, do whatever I ask her for, and be busty and. Stepping out from the group. Excited Issei started listing his requirements for a familiar, but then suddenly stopped. Wait, what familiar I want? Maybe one similar to Baku's? Or maybe sexy fire sprite lady? Shy monster girl? Or, or maybe you would think about their combat efficiency rather than their look? Like you didn't have enough women around you lately. Septimus butted into his monologue. I want a cute girl. If you prefer something that looks like a stand from Jojo, that's your problem. Besides, if I try, I can find a beauty that is also powerful. So stick to your own business. Shouting in defiance, Issei turned to the group with his hands raised up and burning eyes, ready to defend from any logical or not arguments. His perverted mind wouldn't allow him to miss a chance like that, even if the lady his future familiar would end up totally useless. Listen, idiot, what? His brother closed in on him, preparing to explain to Brunette how his choice of familiar would project on him, and how weak one would end up being a laughingstock. Even if he'd have to go manually through defenses. But before he could start, something interrupted him. Gotta catch em all. I'm the, from above the someone unexpectedly shouted a catchphrase and tried to introduce himself. Keyword tried because his interruption was in turn interrupted by two fireballs hitting the branch he was standing on. Back at the ground, both Hyodos had their right hands aiming up with magic circles summoned, looking as mysterious person jumped frantically on a different bow before the flames got to him. At the same time rest of the peerage following teenagers tracks instinctively ready to defend themselves. Could you kindly stay out when someone is about to have an argument? discussion, I mean. Issei shouted, preparing another fiery orb. Getting a better look at the newcomer, the group finally noticed that the one who discerned that he was a scruffy man with a reversely put cap, trying to put off embers that got on his shorts. Recognizing him, Kiba and Kaneko rushed to the dragon and Nekomata, forcibly lowering their hands. Wait, he's not an enemy. Kaneko's right, he's the familiar master, a professional in catching them. I know that after yesterday we're all jumpy, but he'll be our guide. You can relax. With their colleagues' assurance, Issei and Septimus dropped their battle attitude. As they gave eccentric man better look, 
specifically his clothes, Septimus facepalmed while Issei stared with a deadpan expression. Our guide is some. Hobo Ash Ketchum. Seriously. Issei said seemingly without emotion. However, deep inside he felt his childhood memories crumble just by looking at the man before him. Like when to meet your hero, only to find he's the worst kind of scumbag. At least we know now what happens when you don't, catch em all. Septimus besides sobbed broken up. Not sure what to do, Kiba looked at Kaneko for help, only to get an indifferent shrug. He remembered his king comparing the familiar master to some anime character when they met him for the first time, but he didn't know what it was all about. Kiyom is the only one who wasn't part of the peerage stared surprised at the scene. Did they do that often? Yes, came tired choral answer from devils. As night padded brothers backs awkwardly trying to cheer them up, Zatoji coughed and struck a pose on his spot. All right, I am the familiar master. Zato. Exactly at this moment, a green magical circle appeared next to the Grimori group, effectively drawing everyone's attention. Before the light died down, an angry black-haired fallen angel rushed out of it with a menacing face. Rainair, as it obviously was her, in a second reached depressed brothers and grabbed the weeping one. What was that redhead talking about? Why am I joining this stupid club? I don't want to spend any more time than necessary with you, I have my own life too. She shook around the Nekomata and screamed into his face, without getting any reaction other than silent crying. The mentioned redhead wasn't sure if she should feel hurt about her club being called stupid, but she knew one thing. If she let them, they'd probably create another absurd situation ending with her getting more paperwork and migraine. And that was the last what she wanted. When Kiba instinctively reached to the sword when the fallen closed in, Rias gave him a sign to calm down and sighed. The king didn't know how to deal with her pawn and bishop, so hoping that they would get better by themselves, she turned to the easier problem with a wide smile. Rainer San, yours and Mittelt San's memberships were a request from Azazel to help you acclimatize in the school and its supernatural part. Also, as a part of the occult research club, we can sometimes skip classes or go on trips under the cover of club activities. Seeing her reaction, Rias already knew that her negotiation was successful and her smile gained more devilish trait. At the mention of skipping classes, Rainer with her eyes shining immediately dropped Septimus and turned to the princess. Why you didn't start with that from the beginning? If Azazel Sama asked of this, it'll be a pleasure to be part of your wonderful club. By the way, how often can I use this excuse? With Rainer now shaking Rhea's hand instead, Kaneko looked at the fallen angel with distaste. I hate fakes. Akino, on the other hand, giggled bemusedly as a certain thought appeared in her mind. It is said that strong beings are always distinctive and leaders of three factions seem to prove that. If so, I can't wait to see how high our two members will reach in the future. Her seductively ended sentence seemed to wake Hyodos up, as Issei stopped staring blankly and looked around searching for the beauty that showed in his mind. His brother did the same, but instead of a beautiful lady, Queen's words created an image of a spider having him tied and preparing to eat him. Shaking the remnants of their dreams, they finally noticed uninvited guest. Quote dot dot dot, can I finally finish my introduction? Hello, the familiar master. Zatoji here. From up above came pitiful voice of forgotten familiar master. Not only he was interrupted two times, but then he was left standing in his pose without anyone caring. Quote dot dot dot, who's this loser? Rainair shot without any mercy. Image of how a Pokemon masters end. Our guide here, Issei answered while trying not to look at him. Do we really need him? We have Hiccup here, isn't she enough? Septimus pointed at third year with curls, who involuntarily hiccuped angrily at the nickname. Stop calling me that hick, and I'm here to help you with taking care of your familiars after you form a contract with them. When it comes to catching them, Zatoji San is a renowned expert who knows the forest like no one else. Issei found her little hiccup rather cute and wonderful, as it made her breasts bounce to his delight. 
It also made two older devils remember to tease her about this later. Zatoji lightened up at the praise, regaining some of his pride. Jumping off, he fixed his cap and skimmed over the group. So you want familiars to contract? Tell me then what do you seek? The one that can take anything and remain intact. The one that can kill with its reek. His speech, or more precisely poor rhymes, elicited a pained scowl on Septimus, face. But before he could say anything, Issei rushed with his answer. I want a girl familiar, the cuter the better. There wasn't much of a reaction, as everyone except Zatoji expected exactly that kind of answer. However, no one knew what familiar Septimus wanted, so their eyes turned on him with curiosity. I don't know, came short reply, I'll decide when I'll see one that will be the one. That's actually a rather vague answer for yourself, Sept San. You don't have any requirements for your future familiar. Blonde Knight asked, finding it quite strange. For what he knew his teammate, he thought that he'd have a list ready, or at least something funny. Like, I want a black one, or, it has to be some cat. None, so I'll just go and fly around till I find something. If Hiccup is just here to help after we get one, then I think I can get by without the help of Hobo Ketchum. Grinning, he shrugged and released his cat attributes. In the next second shadows gathered around his body, only to quickly disperse with Septimus gone. And he's gone with another dramatic departure. Issei sighed. All right, so where I can find my pretty familiar. Taking a deep breath, middle-aged man in short started his lecture. Another newbie, you want foremost strong familiars, one that complements your own abilities, not. Don't care, it has to be a cute girl. If she is strong, that's good, but cute is more important. And of course, he was again interrupted by Issei sporting deadly serious face. Back with the observing group, Rias raised her hand. How about we check the female ones first as Ai's kun wants? If we don't find any fitting, we'll check those best suited for his abilities. As expected of Bucho, she always has the best ideas. Issei nodded energetically on that, with his words causing small blush and content smile to appear on Redhead's face. Hum, I think there is one here that fit every demand. Beautiful, strong and as a dragon, so should be perfectly compatible with this half one. The familiar master must, surprising Issei with recognizing what he was. But it will be extremely hard to tame Dragon King of Tiamat's collide. No, can I at least once say something without being interrupted? Issei's, and surprisingly out of nowhere Albion's, loud deny finally was too much of disruptions for Zatoji. I'm sorry. Weird man, but Tiamat and my grandson just, shouldn't meet anytime soon. She and his second grandfather have some history together. Dragon's voice echoed from teenager's chest, filling both with dread. Both old dragons were sure that Tiamat was still mad at Diedrake, about what neither he or Albion remembered, and was killing his every host. And if she'd sense similar energy signature to Red Dragon Emperors, there was a high possibility that she'd kill him before he could explain who he was. Or that she'd still try to kill him even then. And who are you and his other grandfather? Zatoji asked curiously, previously taking the reincarnated devil before him for normal dragon hybrid. Rare, but not to the extent to gain enough attention of Dragon King to be hunted by her. As most dragons, Albion was not the one to let a chance to flaunt his fame get by. As he started with his booming voice, Issei offhandedly noticed that it was loud enough to cause girls' big assets to wobble a little. At least if they had something to wobble, Issei corrected himself when his eyes landed on Kaneko. When small Rook felt on herself someone's pitiful gaze a thought of kicking someone really hard pooped up in her head. Heed my words carefully then, catcher of beasts. I am known as Albion, the White Dragon Emperor, the Vanishing Dragon and the White Dragon of Supremacy. As for his other grandfather, he is my eternal rival, the Red Dragon Emperor, White Diedrag Gok. After introducing himself, White Dragon retreated his presence, leaving only enough to listen. Zatoji listened with wide eyes glued to the Issei, 
who in turn had his own locked on the bouncing spectacle. At first, he took the kid for just a pervert, who wanted nothing else but someone with boobs to answer his every order. But now hearing legendary dragon's words, everything made sense. If he was even partly as strong as these two, he didn't need more power. He was, or had the potential to be, a fucking killing machine, so why give a fuck? At least that's what the familiar master thought. Not that he knew that his first idea about Issei was almost spot on. 1. When Thunderous Voice silenced down, Busty Beast Tamer run over and pressed her assets to Half-Breed's back. Wrapping her arms around him, Kiyom spoke with professional pride. Before you even think about catching him and turning into a familiar, Zatoji-san, know that the only one that will tame this dragon is me. Said dragon just stood in his place with his face melted into a perverted grin and thin blood trail falling from his nose. Others' reactions were, era era, Akino giggled a little and licked her lips. Kion, leave my servant. Rias raised her voice slightly jealous and tried to get her classmate off the pawn. Quote dot 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 quote. Kiba stood, smiling uncertainly without a word. Quote dot dot dot. Get a room. Kaneko muttered, still wanting to kick something. Quote dot 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 quote. Zatoji just like Kiba stayed silent. However, it was because he didn't want to give any wrong ideas to the beast tamer or be interrupted yet another time. This is fucking hilarious, thought both Rainer and watching it through Issei's mind Septimus. DXD. So, where do we go first? With Zatoji leading the group through the forest, they moved undisturbed by its locators, giving them time to talk. Before Rainer asked her question, the main one talking was Rias explaining to Kiyom how she wouldn't allow for her servant to be tamed, with Akino adding her few cents about their king's possessiveness. Eyeing the familiar master, who through the whole way was weirdly silent, Issei scratched his head. I'm not sure, he said about a lake and water spirits, but that's all. Anyway, leaving aside that you're still with us, how did you even got here? Shouldn't this place be a secret only known to devils with how easy it'd be to ambush someone here? Fallen Angel turned her head the other way, clearly not wanting to meet brown eyes looking at her. I asked Elaine about coordinates. As much as I hate it, I and Mittelt are now your assistants. There shouldn't be problems with me being here if I say that it was to help you. At that, Issei grinned much like his brother. Don't you mean help Sep? From what Zaz said he got you while I have Mittelt. Shut up. You don't need to remind me. Rainer finally turned to him, red with annoyance. As he finally could see her face, Issei noticed that she was nervously chewing her lips trying to say something. How? Cough how you and your idiot brother cope with being devils now. There were many things that could be said of brown-haired Hyodo. He was so perverted, that sight of boobs clouded his mind and resulted in him dying. He was somewhat dense with women's, he was told that many times and knew that himself. Not to the point when a girl would literally throw herself at him and he still didn't take a hint, but nonetheless dense. But staring at his childhood friend now, one glance was enough for him to understand what she was trying to do. She felt guilty of what happened to them and now tried to say, sorry, as clumsy as it came out. It's weird, but not in a bad way. Actually, I think it will turn into something fun. And I'm sure that Sep is of the same mind. So just as he told me right after the church action, don't try to sulk about what happened. You did what you did because you were controlled. No one is blaming you of anything. Maybe accept your scheme with Asia, but if you apologize to her I'm sure she'll forgive you. As he ended little cheering up speech, Issei spread his arms to give Rainer warm, friendly hug. The girl at first was reluctant, but seeing that Issei wasn't going to give up, she embraced him. Feeling some of the guilt that Fallen didn't want to admit was their melt, she tightened the hug. Meanwhile, listening to it all from the sidelines group released simultaneous sigh at the cozy scene before them. For the record, I blame her for being a Cretan to get into this situation in the first place. A jolly voice sounded jokingly in Brunette's head. Shut up, 
you're ruining the moment. Issei tiredly scolded his brother, simultaneously getting the image of Septimus running after some scent and brimming with happiness. We're here. Familiar master's voice broke the mood completely, gaining everyone's attention. Leaving with a small smile and lighter heart, Rainair turned with the rest to see a small lake. This place is where water spirits reside. If we're lucky, you will have a chance to form a contract with an Undine. But aren't Undines? Hyeong wanted to say something, but Zadoji shook slightly his head with a small glint in his eye, stopping her. Are they females? If yes, where are they? Issei asked with excitement, causing flicker in older man's eyes to become more noticeable. Oh, they are. Just wait a minute and see for yourself. Standing there, through Issei's mind rushed images of various scenes depicting water spirits that were among his adult collection. As he stared eagerly at Lake's mirror, he didn't notice his senior taking a step back, like she expected something to happen. When the surface started to bubble and steam raised, Issei closed almost to the edge of the water, waiting for the girl of his dreams to appear. Poof! In a cloud of smoke, mere centimeters from Dragon's face, an Undine appeared. However, where he expected a pretty woman with soft bust was a mountain of meat two times his size, with a face that looked like hammered from a stone. However, she, had breast, even if they were unnoticeable among all that muscles. Wah! Issei shouted, landing on his back and crawling as far from the monster that showed up before him. What the fuck is this? An Undine, as I don't know what you think is cute. I brought you to the one that filled all your other requests. It's a female, she's strong and has big breasts. Don't fuck with me, you know perfectly well that this is the exact opposite of, cute. And don't call that thing a female. Right then, stopping Issei from throwing some epithets about what he thought that the creature in the water was, an animal that looked like a giant fusion of lion and wolf hurried before them. The beast was taller than them with claws and teeth like swords, but it looked like it was running away in panic. Quote dot dot dot, that's the first time I saw a Lydian king so terrified. Voiced astonished Zatoji, come back here, you pussy. I'm not gonna bite you. From where the giant feline appeared, known to all voice echoed, followed by a mix of black and white. Seeing his friends, Septimus stopped running and waved happily. What's up? How's your hunt? I have to tell that mine was what the fuck is this? An Undine. And apparently, it's a girl. Issei answered when male Nekomata shouted at the sight of a water spirit. No fuck. DXD. Issei was completely exhausted. Even worse, he felt like that time when he went with his sisters to the mall on a Christmas shopping a few years ago, that ended with him sleeping it off for two days. When Septimus ran off after his prey and Zadoji became serious under the threat of being burnt alive and then thrown to that Undine, they visited few promising candidates. But all of them lacked something. First was a pack of harpies. They were fast, great at scouting and setting traps during a battle, even somewhat cute. When Issei introduced himself as a devil looking for a familiar, all of them went nuts, clawing at him and screaming with their high voices to pick them. But as he slipped that he was actually part dragon, they became even worse, flying around and running while screaming that some monster wanted to roast them. Bird brains. Besides, Keom said that, because of the evolution to increase their proficiency in flying their bodies almost never developed breasts bigger than a cup. Fuck you, evolution. Next was their fiery cousins, Furies. Less cute more for predatory sexiness, surrounded in flaming dresses and with large assets, they won Issei's perverted side at first sight. However, when he tried to form a contract with one of them, she listed her demands. Which consisted mostly of situations with the contractor being subject to weird punishments, sadistic plays and him testing even weirder devices. And the list was long. Out of concern for his safety, Issei had to refuse them and go back to searching. Also, back with the group, watching it all Akino was becoming quite jealous and yellow sparks cracked between her fingers. Too dangerous. Another, a girl with an elvish face, 
long ears, big, dear eyes, and shining hair. The definition of cuteness and girlishness. But shortly after, she turned out to be a trap. Denied, when he found shape-shifting slime that could take any form, Issei thought that he'd finally hit the jackpot. Then Septimus showed up again, this time chasing after a hydra that trampled over the poor slime and killed it. He was going make him pay for that later. And so on, with more of candidates failing. That's useless, I give up. Maybe I am not destined to meet my perfect familiar. Or should I ask Ella to make me one? Issei whined on Rhea's lap. When the moon started its journey through the sky they decided to take a break on the top of a small hill. Issei immediately accepted when Redhead Beauty offered him her thighs as a lap pillow, showing her domination over the new competition. But even the softness under his head couldn't bring him happiness now. Shish, shish, it's all right eyes coon, we will look more in a moment. Now rest. Rias softly hushed to his ear, weaving fingers through his hair. Having a picnic party without me. You're awful. From near shadows walked Septimus swaying his tails happily and heading under some random tree. Where's food? Hey, Sep, came Issei's lifeless greetings. We don't have food, our familiars. Sucks to be you. Oi, Kone Neko, do you have any sweets that you want to share? Kaneko glared coldly at him, hiding a pack of candies behind her backs. I don't, they're mine. As she gave him a more careful look, small devil asked quote dot 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 you're too happy that's suspicious love you too and of course i'm happy i found my perfect familiar it's a long story but she saved me from a pack of furies chasing after my tails by pranking them she shots little stars too and the best she gets my jokes nisa they're the band i told you about at his words, a small girl in orange dress pooped up from hair between his cat ears. And the word, small, was not saying that she looked young. Actually, her body build was like any girl in her late teens. Small, was for her height, that was roughly 15 centimeters, for she was a pixie. She had flowing hair matching her dress, elvish ears sticking out and almond eyes with orange irises. Yoha. I'm Nisa, nice to meet you. Seppi told me a little about you. Hiccup, bondage predator, unconfirmed weeb and the rest. Little fairy flew up with a butterfly-like wing and pointed respectively on Kiyom, Akino, and Rias, finishing with a twirl in the air. Oh no, there's two of them now. Rainair groaned painfully, followed by angry hiccup from blonde beast tamer and sighs from both female devils. Hick please don't call me that awful name. I'm Kiyom Abe, nice to meet you. I thought that your kind is almost impossible to catch, how did Septimus manage to do this? Making another twirl, Nisa landed on Nekomata's head. He didn't catch me, he asked me to become his familiar. I agreed, but only if he allows me to pet his ears whenever I want in addition to the standard familiar agreement. Now we just need to seal the deal with the ceremony. Quote dot 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 quote. Issei stared in silence at his brother and his new familiar, slowly rising from the ground. Then they heard quiet crying sounds from him as he started walking numbly. He got a fairy, cute flying pixie, and I got nothing. Bucho, I give up. I won't find anything that beats her. Eyes coon, watch out. You're, Kiba raised trying to stop Brunette before he reached sharp fall of the hill. Too late, Kaneko said as Issei already lost his footing. Wa tilde tilde ah, crash, dot dot dot, snap, dot dot dot, splash, ea, i y a, walking up to the edge that Issei fell off of and listening to the sounds of him crashing down it, the group repeated the last sound that didn't seem to fit in. Following the track of broken branches and young trees, they arrived at a small hot spring. And there was Issei, fully soaked, with his face buried between a pair of breasts. As for the owner of a said pair, she was. A Lamia, huh, I didn't know that there were any here. The screaming girl seemed to be around their age and like Zatoji said, was a Lamia. 
with red scales covering part of her face, as well as long snake tail and pointy ears and bright hair reaching down her spine all the same color. Pervert, molester, deviant, peeping Tom, help, help. Snake Girl kept screaming as she wrapped Issei in her tail and started throwing the teen around. It doesn't look like she needs any help, Akino noted, watching as their pawn coursed through the air and underwater with an idiotic grin on his face. Good job with that swing. Now throw him and let's see how far this pervert can fly. Kaneko cheered for the red girl. Meanwhile, still smiling Issei was sure that he wanted this Lamia as his familiar. The softness and volume of her boobs mixed with her beauty were enough, but the strength she displayed should satisfy his grandfather's and Sep. Cute, strong, big-chested and with her being reptilian while he was dragon hybrid, there should be perfect compatibility between them. Accepted. I think, he stopped when his head went underwater. That I've found, another quick dip, my familiar. Hearing this, Septimus grinned and bowed theatrically to Keon. Could you do the honors? What are you talking about? The blonde tilted her head. She a Lamia, and Issei is what he is. That alone should be enough to convince her. Seeing realization dawning on the older girl's face, Bishop's grin only widened. The busty beast tamer rushed to the edge of the lake and got the attention of raging redhead. Sorry, Lamia San. Can you please calm down for a second and stop swinging around my friend's brother? When Lamia listened, although still having Issei coiled in her tail, Kiyom went on. Thank you. My name is Abe Kiyom. What's yours? Mia. All right. Mia San. We're sorry that our friend interrupted your bathe, but we're actually looking for a familiar for him. Unfortunately, as he is part dragon, he had some problems with that. Hearing Kiyom, Accidentally, dropped that Issei was a dragon, Mia's mood did a 180 degree turn. She blushed madly and started shaking as she stared at him, unconsciously tightening her grip and cutting out air supply for him. Aa ah dragon. I'm sorry, I didn't know, dragon sama. If why you're looking f for a familiar m maybe you see could consider m me. With her blush intensifying and painting her face the same shade of red as her scales, Lamia stuttered through her embarrassment. As she couldn't look Issei in the eyes at her last words, to his delight she pushed his head where it first landed. Right into her bosom. What's going on here? Rainair voice thoughts of almost everyone gathered except for both. Monster experts and black-haired Nekomata. You see, draw, Zadoji started explaining. Dragons, as the apex of all creation, are feared and respected by all creatures, just as it should be. However, with most reptilian species that respect is even stronger to the point that some weaker ones worship us like gods. This young lady reaction is normal, or I'd even say quite shy compared to some other cases. Albion's voice sounded from Septimus, chest, once again stopping the middle-aged man in the shorts. What old lizard said, basically, in reptilian world dragons are celebrities and this situation here is like your favorite actor or pop star showing up when you bathe while looking for a partner to next show. More or less, teenage whose chest served as spirit speaker finished explaining what was happening. I approve of her being Issei's familiar. Little Snake does have potential. Diedreg added his comment to the discussion. You like her because she is red. Meanwhile, between being drowned, crashed and now suffocated by a pair of boobs, Issei finally passed out. But even as his consciousness drifted away he still only thought about two orbs serving as his pillows, their softness and springiness. The last sound before the darkness swallowed him up completely was Mia's scared scream. Help, he stopped breathing, I didn't mean that, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, DXD. After five minutes of resuscitation followed by small electroshock from Akino, they managed to bring Issei back from Apiland. There was an argument who should be the one doing this, between Mia who said it was her fault and her responsibility, Rias saying that Issei was her servant, Kiyom who apparently as tennis club president had CPR certificate and Akino saying she wanted a taste of her underclassmen. 
The argument ended when Septimus got bored of they squabble and without asking anyone started artificially pump air into Issei's lungs with magic. The first thing that his brother did after waking up and hearing what happened, was punching him hard in the jaw for that. Then followed with another one for that poor shape shifting slime, knocking him out. Because of that, they had to wake up him in turn. This time there was no quarrels as Rainair morphed her light into a bucket and poured water on him, chuckling darkly. Following the binding ceremony and a lecture from Beast Tamer how to properly take care of their new partners, Grimori party left the forest with two new members. One was happily mumbling about being bound to her, Eyes Sama, and other sat on her master's head. The club room surprisingly wasn't empty, Izuna was there still reading. After quick goodbyes and grabbing their sister before she got her hands on either familiar, everyone back went to their homes. Coming from a magic circle, three Hyodos sneaked through the house to not wake anyone. DXD, wake up, darling, wake up and your sweetheart will give you a delicious treat. Herself, the seductively low voice came from Issei's alarm, sneaking into Pervert's ears. Lazily moving his hand, he dropped where he thought the alarm was. Darling, soft voice moaning next to his ear, even softer sensation under his hand. There was something familiar in this scene to Issei. Opening his eyes, there was his new familiar partly coiled around him and laying reversely face to face. And his hand was squeezing her naked breast over his head. Gulping nervously, Issei took a second to calm down. Pushing away thoughts how even she got here or ended in such position, teenager whispered to himself. Calm down, calm down. You've been in this situation, now the universe is giving you a second chance to do it right. She shows up in your bed, naked, is your familiar and treats you like a superstar. Don't freak out, play it. Right, wake her with a kiss, let the hormones do the rest. Nearing to her sleeping face, Issei felt his heart beat like crazy. He was about to have his first kiss. Not counting that one accidental with that chestnut-haired boy from Exorcist family, but let's forget that ever happened. This was here and now, his chance to start building his harem. With his lips about to meet her, his eyes closed and ready for this sensation on his lips. Thud, opening their eyes in panic, both Issei and Mia, who was faking her sleep, stared at another redhead that landed on them from the ceiling, interrupting what was about to happen. Rias without waiting started unbuttoning her school uniform and stared at her pawn with eyes filled with desperation. Issei, please, take my virginity. Ex Moss Omake, can't you fly this shit faster? I'm already pushing it to its limits and over them with my powers. How is that time bender working there? It works, that's all I can say. I don't know for how long, so fly those sleigh faster. Dashing through the snow, in a one-horse open sleigh, two brothers were doing Santa's job, arguing all the way. Issei and Septimus in Santa outfits, although the second one was black instead of red, flew through the blizzard. Issei stood in the front, shining red while holding the reins and pouring all his power and aura through them. The result was Santa's sleigh flying two times over their normal speed, with a giant blaze coming out of its back. Behind him, next to the giant sack was Septimus, surrounded by numerous magic circles shining angry red, powering clunky looking piece of machinery. It was, in fact, a device that slowed time around the vehicle. Thanks to that device Santa Claus could travel around the world and give presents to every kid there within 24 hours. And now he wasn't doing this, because, we wouldn't be here, freezing our asses out, if you didn't knock out the Santa Claus. Issei shouted, taking a sharp turn to avoid the particularly nasty looking cloud. It's not my fault, what was I supposed to do when I saw someone sneaking in our house without any lights? Balancing himself after the dangerous maneuver, his brother kept summoning more circles around. You've put the fucking Santa Claus into a coma. And because of you, Christmas is a week too late. The reason why this situation came into existence was that in Christmas Eve Septimus, walking down to the kitchen for a night snack, 
stumbled upon an unknown person in the darkness. That led him to in a matter of seconds summon dozen magic circles, couple talismans, scribe few lines of runes and cast a pack of curses, the magical one mixed with insults, then throw it all at the burglar. The results, half of the household woken up by an explosion, large hole in his mother's favorite carpet and an unconscious Santa on the floor. For the first three days Septimus and Issei, who was blackmailed into this by a threat to his precious collection, tried in vain to wake Father Christmas up. When this didn't work, they left him to get better by himself and decided to give gifts by themselves, even if little late. They've spent another two days trying to start the vehicle that was on their roof. After that, what came at the price of a few burns, there was one last day to learn how to drive that thing, full of crashes, cursing and near-death experiences. But finally, on the seventh day, they rushed in the most iconic sleigh in the world to give presents to every child. Okay, I've got this. It should hold for at least an hour. Nekomata shouted as all the circles suddenly turned green. Perfect, we're over the next town, so do your job. Issei shouted back slowing down a little. Ho 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 and Merry Christmas, this devil here is about to carpet bomb your town. With presents, shouting this, he summoned hundreds of small circles and turned the sack, letting the presents to fall in the air and be caught by the circles. Not surprised with the sack miraculously filling itself, Septimus watched as his, missiles, slowly coursed to their targets. Done. To the next town, Issei Santa. That's all for now until next time.